number of lackers out there. And, you know, we see uh, our surveys keep saying that 55% of people don't have their databases under source control, which is just astonishing. And that number is not really, really going down. So I, I mean, we, we've kind of we've seen this stuff in high level, and I think there's still a lot of gaps in that VSO platform and in Vnext, and it, it is definitely coming. But you know, Microsoft are a little bit behind the curve in a certain sense. So are they really talking about packaging and versioning strategies and that? When we went, uh, when we started the conversation about what does this good pipeline look like, we talked a lot about packages and versioning. Mm -hmm. well, what are some of the concepts that you are seeing out there now that you would consider to be kind of best in class in this space and that we should start to think about? Um, in, in terms of development, I, I don't think you can talk about um, versioning of your application, your source code, without talking about some sort of branching strategy. Um, Branching strategies is a whole other panel discussion, so we'll not get into that too much. But in terms of source control, in terms of having knowledge of what your change is going to do downstream of your, uh, so if people take a dependency on your package or product, uh, having knowledge of what changes are going into the next release, whether it's a, a bug fix release, whether it's a minor release, whether it's a major release, um, that's something you you as the developers uh, and the processes that you uh, encapsulate, you need to take ownership of that. You need to know what's going into your product. Because if you if you release a, a semantic uh, patch version of your product and it has a backwards, non-backward uh, compatible change in it, then it's going to come back with you. So you need to understand what uh, changes you're making and why you're making them and then reflect that publicly via the version number that you've got. I think with regards to packaging specifically, I think it's fantastic that that Microsoft saw chocolatey was happening and developed one get over the top um, and didn't crush the product or try and buy the product, um, but it, it embraced it and realised that that you know writing MSIs wasn't cutting it anymore um, and there was better tools out there. So that that is one a one a great example of, of, of that being of that being done and. To, to, to slightly come back to the stuff you're saying about about the, the kind of long tail of, of legacy is is you know we we're, we're now open table are moving are moving a lot of our stuff we're, we're very glad of the open source things like the, the, the .NET core and everything else because we're now moving our .NET applications into into mono and and and, and into moving moving it that way our our applications which were partially considered legacy and um, because they run on old uh, Windows versions and everything else we can now just move them to a, to a you know we can use that use some of that tool and some of that open source tooling that's been, that's been you know supported by Microsoft and and and, and make that migration in a, in, a, in, a, in a much better way than we would have previously we, to be honest in before this sort of stuff came about we would have just rewritten it in something else and, and, and spent three months writing rewriting it but now we don't have to any thoughts around the versioning piece? Any questions about that? Okay. So I guess um, that as we take these packages through them, we, we, we talk about branching rules, rules and that. It gets ever more complicated as we look at DBCS and, and different methods. But what, where are these packages going through the pipeline? Where do we store them? How do we kind of manage those effectively? Are there, are there good tools out there today, James? Or are we we also look at you know, how we push these things through the pipeline. So we're looking at, yeah, um, back to Farley world with the uh, build packages once, where are you going to put that package? Um, do you just stick it on a net share and hope for the best? At least you can back that up, right? <laughs> um, but there obviously there's, there's dedicated tooling out there for that as well. There are all that tooling. Um, so you've got the likes of Artifactory, Nexus, and then you've got built-in artifact repositories within TeamCity, Octopus, and so on. Um, so it's, it's it's a question of how seriously you want to take your artifact management. Um, some of the superior to others. I mean, there's ones inside inside Jenkins as well. Um, but if you need something that's browsable, or, you know, high availability, and that sort of thing, you need to look at a very specific tool. Um, so I think you're kind of limited there to, to the likes of Nexus and Artifactory. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's it's whatever suits you. There's those, those, I guess, for the high, high end kind of things, and then if you just want to, to package something and, and be able to restore it and have a backup of it, then, you know, Team City and Octopus have their own built in 
artifact repositories, and of course then you, you're back to the versioning because you want to enable them. Um, but yeah, plenty of tools. Okay, I'm just uh, conscious of time. Oh, there's a question here at the front. So a, pack, a, pa a proper package, so I do hate MSIs, the only reason I, the only reason I hate MSIs is because they're terrible to author. What's um, wrong with Wix? <laughs> Every word. Three months of my life is what's wrong with Wix. Um, the, so yeah, the, the properties of a, of, a, of, a, of a proper package are really in, in the metadata, so um, actually having information that's queryable about that package, about the not just you know the version, who authored it, what that package is about, um, and then also the, um, the, the the kind of scripts that, that get built into that package. How is this package installed? How do I roll back this package if it goes wrong? Um, how do I you know? If, if, we don't really have this in the Windows world so much, but in the in the in the Linux world, you have you know how how do I uh, you know get the, the, the status of this the thing that this is managing? Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of extra stuff that, that you get with a package that you don't just get with a you know some cold code in a folder or you know, in a zip file. And it's, it's that metadata that you can then that, you know the, the 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 benefits of having things like the artifact and the Nexus with those binaries in there is that then you can start to query that metadata. Um, and you can start to get useful information about that metadata. Um, an example of that is, um, you know, I can say in my package that these are my dependencies. You can then say, okay, I know this dependency out in the wild is bad. Okay, let's search Artifactory for all of the packages that have that dependency and, and kill them off. Um, you can never do that with a zip package. Sorry, anything to kind of answer that? Or? Uh, no, just expand really on uh, what's been said already. I mean, one of the key things in terms of um, having your application work on, on the deployment environment you're going to is something like Dean says, the dependencies. Something like Chocolate and NuGet for that allow you to define in the same way that you can with NPM and all those other package managers, these are the things I need for this to work. So if you've got a dependency on, I'm not going to think of anything now, but if your package takes a direct dependency on a specific version, you can do that and provide that within the metadata for the package. Now, although you can do that within something like an MSI as well, that's things like a, a, a custom task, a custom action within Wix that it's XML hell that you don't necessarily want to go down. But there are other tools, again, we're speaking about tooling, things like Squirrel based packages that allow you to do the auto updating. Uh, I don't think I'd wish Click Once deployment on anyone, but something like Squirrel is a new contender to the throne that allows you to do that sort of deployment and upgrade path as well. So uh, Richard, once we bring databases into the mix, are there any things that you can see in standard package formats that enrich the database there process, or is it just... Well, it's, it's, a, good it's a good question, because the obvious answer is it's, uh, it's metadata, it's dependencies, and information, and it's binaries. But what if you're uh, deploying something that doesn't have a binary, like a, like a database? So what we do is we have a, a snapshot, effectively, of a, of a database state. Um, uh, for the main, it's also running really but for the main sort of Redgate solution, uh, which we then transform into release artifacts once we start to look at the release targets, and then we take another state and we say, no, this, this is a releasable artifact. So we're a, bit, a little bit divergent from uh, uh, from uh, from the norm in some ways there, but that's that's born of necessity rather than uh, you know not getting it. It's uh, you know we don't have binaries, um, so uh, so it is something. Else. There's also an interesting point about. Uh, you know, what else can it contain? Is it, does it make any sense to have anything else in there that's useful, that's useful artifact to describe? If you're looking at data, uh, if you're looking at database state, it's got dependencies as well. It's this information about how that data is used, and what data it requires in order to function, that could potentially be in that in that package. Are you deviating then from uh, what is a you know what is a, a deployable artifact? 
you know, if you've got some information that you have, that, you know, these, this is used by an SSIS package, you might want to check your deployment, you know, your release manager might want to consider, bear this in mind if it wants to just make that available as metadata. It does, you know, if you deviate too far from what a, what a package is supposed to be. So there's some, one thing I've got to quickly say is that I think containers are going to massively change that, that world very soon. So as soon as nano is available, then um, it, um, it's, it's just going to be um, containers all the way. I mean, I can't think of an argument for why you wouldn't go down that route to an elegant packaging solution. And a wonderful segue into the way of finish. It's almost like we've planned this. Um, I just want to finish with like one last question, a really quick one. It kind of sets the scene a little bit for uh, the last panel session this afternoon, which is it's talking really about what's next, um, but also to kind of maybe stimulate some some conversation with the drug speech. So, if I can just ask you really quickly to run through, we'll start with James and finish with Liam. Um, tell me what you know. If you could have one thing happen in, in the course of the next six to twelve months, that's gonna really kind of make a difference to the CI, CD, kind of DevOps uh, world around pipelines. Well, can you can you think about something that's going to change it? I mean, you started talking about containers, nano. Well, yeah, I think... What's I really, one thing you want? I, I, I'd, I'd love to see that world just really, just to set it once now, and, and have a, a sort of a, a container platform as a service as well. So something like what Google are kind of working on, where I, where I can just deploy my... my my, my container into an environment and not actually care what VM it runs on. One of the constraints at the moment is if I want to deploy my, my container, I still need to run up my VM and configure the, the, the VM in the first place. So it's it's not really solving that problem. Um, so if there was just a kind of a I don't care about it sort of um, container cloud that I just go, well, there's my container, go run, uh, then that would be really great. Containers are cool, Richard? Um, yeah, except for the uh, state of your data, <laughs> which, uh, which is uh, still an unsolved problem. We'll leave that for you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I'm glad to that. Um, yeah, it is, it is containers and it, it is, it is uh, uh, nano server and uh, the, the old microservices and all that. It's, it's all tying together into a sort of a, a fairly neat message and uh, to be honest, it's sort of Scares the hell out of me is uh, somebody's worked in the data area for you know 20 years. Um, I do have empathy for the person who's got to um, uh, provide the auditor with something that looks familiar, that doesn't look completely different to the thing that we saw last year, and has to provide the CFO with data that still looks the same and is still you know constructed the same. So uh, what I'd really uh, obviously you know Brett hopefully going to be involved with, what I'd really like to see is uh, uh, some kind of understanding of the dependencies in the data tier being being mapped out properly in a way that we can, we can use them together with continuous integration and uh, move quickly. Barry, one thing you'd like to see change in the next few months? I, I think I just have to echo the same points. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely uh, excited about the containers coming into play. Uh, I think the, the Just Eat uh, uh, presentation we had this morning, one of the main things there was the time it takes to, to spin up that VM that he's got going. So if you can get that into, a, uh, into the minutes rather than the tens of minutes, it's just going to make the, 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 the pipeline that we're working towards that bit quicker uh, and make it uh, more robust and uh, easier to use going forward. So, yeah, definitely for that. Uh, yeah, I think exactly the, the first point I want something that is, you know, so I'm really looking forward to the containers because I want tooling like Mesos or Kubernetes um, over the top so I care even less about the OS than I do now. Um, and that way, you know, the, the ultimate end state for me is that. that that it's, it's you know across across cloud providers, so I can you know as an operations person that I am now, I can arbitrage based on cost um, across across cloud vendors and across you know, our internal infrastructure, and, and not have to worry about it. And my my developers don't have to worry about where their stuff lives. Perfect. Okay, so these guys will be around later today, and I'm sure if anyone's staying around for drinks, they'll happily ask uh, answer some more of your questions later on. Just leaves me to thank our panel this afternoon. Thanks very much.